here we are on today's hike, which is up on the western side of the Peak District. You can see Shuttling's Low there and a the Catonfield Road. And we're off aircraft wreck hunting today. So three aircraft wrecks today along one ridge. So without further ado, we'll crack on. Already some stunning views here. Shutland's Low, I used to live at the bottom of there in Wild Boar Clough at the back of Crag Hall a while back. And then you've got stunning views across the whole of the Cheshire Gap. We'll give him better ones. We're heading off here along here to Shining Tor and Cat's Tor, and then we're going to drop down to see a chapel that was on a Channel 4 programme a few years back. But anyway, we're going to crack on along this old track here for the time being. Milestone there, look. You can see how the way they spoke Macclesfield. I find out how old it is, but this must have been the old road. I suspect an old track, cart track maybe. This is a new road, but this was the turnpike. I'll find out when that was uh, built and whatever. Um, but this is a newer road down here, but yeah. So it looks like we're following the, an old route here. I'll find out a bit more about it. I've got the gators on today. So we're going a bit off piste We've had a lot of rain. So uh, to find these three aircraft wrecks, all World War II wrecks. Um, so yeah, we'll crack on. I've had to put me a hard shell on. It's absolutely bitter this wind. Um, checking the mountain weather, for mountain, mountain weather forecast. It's getting down to about zero degrees with the wind, which it, I really did feel that coming up here. So mountain equipment shell on, toasty warm now. We're going to head up here to Shining Tour. So glad I bought my gaiters, that's for sure. Really timed the weather really well. Um, it was absolutely lashing down this morning, but I checked the forecast out and it was finishing about two. And you know what? It has. So, good thing is, there's hardly anyone up here because the weather was so poor this morning. So, bonus, got the place to myself. Let's crack on. Look at this. Coombs Moss there on the other side. Castle Nays just on the end, which is the Iron Age Hill Fort. Then you've got the whole of the Kinder Massive. Looking dark and group blue brooming over there. Group fucking word brooding. Then if you can just see it, but to the left of Shuttingstow, right on the horizon, I'll put a picture up if I can't zoom in well enough on the camera, is uh, the Reakin. So that's right down sort of Telford, Shropshire way, isn't it? Uh, the Reakin. So that's a fair old view. Must be a good 60 mile away at least. But uh, yeah, fantastic. Keep your hands still. So we're heading up here now. A bit of a ascent up to the top of Shining Tor. Here we are, I managed to find the site of the first one. Probably a bit of controversy about this until some people actually uh, dug this site, officially of course, and found some wreckage that proved it was. So this was a Noidian UC-648 Norseman of the 10th Depot Repair Squadron, US Air Force. So this crashed on Shining Tour on the 29th of September 1944, and luckily the pilot survived. So he was basically on a liaison flight from Burton near Warrington to RAF Winthorpe near Newark. Okay, and he spent about, you know, one and a half hours at Newark, um, set off the return leg to Burton Wood, and they counted like a lot of them did, low cloud over the hills, and for, for about five minutes. However, that did worsen. Um, once airborne, he encountered a strong headwind, and so it took him a lot longer to get over here. So he assumed he was beyond the hills, when in fact he wasn't and he started to descend. While still in the on the cloud, he spotted the ground beneath him and then struck the rising ground on this spot here. You can see, we'll have a look in a minute, there's a few remains. Uh, and uh, the aircraft turned over and caught fire, but he was able to escape and made his way off the hill down to Stoke Farm, apparently <laughs> carrying a piece of the wreckage underneath his arm. And then when they asked what that was for, he said it was to defend himself from coyotes. What a story, but he survived that. But anyway, let's have a look at the wreckage. We'll walk around the edge, but you can see metal fragments here. Um, for a while they thought this was the Defiant wreck, which is not nowhere near here. But you can see the molten wreckage here. This scar, I'll get a picture of it when we get to the top. 
but yeah look yeah all the molten metal where it caught fire i'll put a picture of what the aircraft looked like but you can see the score here if i uh, just come up a bit yeah you can see that so this is a the score they thought it was a defiant wreck but like i say i'll find out some pictures but they uh they found a few bits and managed to prove they were off this particular type of aircraft I'll put some info up about it, but in this particular case, um, yeah, he survived, which is good. Some of the others weren't so fortunate. But you can imagine he was flying over this way. The headwind caused him to think he was further ahead than he was and that he'd gone past the hills and then, in, in fact, uh, straight into the side of the hill here. A very lucky man, I suspect, as it caught fire. Anyway, that's the first one down. I'd got to that point down there and just thought, where is it? But uh, I knew there was a score and I could see a dip here and uh, we got to it in the end, there, the 10-figure reference. There's another one further up this hill towards the top of Shining Tour now. Let me just check what that one is. Just give me two seconds. And... The next one is a North American Harvard, so again, another American Air Force. So we're going to ping up to that and then we'll head off over towards the trig and back on the path. Um, here are grouse in the background. I am being very careful because they're all ground nesting birds at this time of year so I'm really taking care. The one thing that it's about this time of year it is easy to get through. The heather's not quite full on or anything. That can be quite draining. So yeah, we're going to head up now find the wreck of the Harvard. The Norian Norseman, also known as a C-64 Norseman, is a Canadian single-engine bush plane designed to operate from unimproved surfaces. Distinctive stubby landing gear protrusions from the lower fuselage make it easily recognisable. Introduced in 1935, the Norseman remained in production for almost 25 years, with over 900 produced, and a number of examples remain in commercial and private use to this day. They are known to have been registered or operated in 68 countries and have been based and flown in the Arctic and Antarctic regions. On the 29th of September 1944, 2nd Lieutenant Fredrickson was tasked with a liaison flight from Burton Wood near Warrington to RAF Winthorpe near Newark on Trent in Nottinghamshire and back. He had left Burton Wood at roughly 13.45 and took some 45 minutes to cover the 80 miles to Newark. Having spent one and a half hours at Newark, 2nd Lieutenant Fredrickson set off for the return leg back to Burton Wood. Outbound, he had encountered low cloud over the hills for about five minutes. However, conditions had worsened by the time he returned. Once airborne, he encountered a strong headwind and, as such, expected the flight to take longer than outbound. After flying for an hour, he assumed he was more than likely beyond the hills and descended. While still in cloud, Fredrickson popped, spotted ground just beneath him and shortly after struck rising ground. The aircraft turned over and caught fire, though Arnold Fredrickson was able to escape the aircraft before the fire had taken hold. He made his way off the hill to Stake Farm, where according to local legend he arrived clutching, clutching a piece of the aircraft. When asked what it was for, he replied it's to fend off the coyotes. Right, so this is a Harvard FT442. We managed to find it again with a really good grid reference. Keep an eye out for craters. So that's all that's left of that. This is a similar to uh, the other guys, a Czech pilot, Sergeant Julius Safranco, uh, in Harvard trainer. This was on 30th of November 1944. Again, he'd come out of, or was descending towards an air base in Shropshire to Hill. Turn Hill, sorry, and he basically again as a headwind, he'd miscalculated where he was. He nosed down through the zero visibility of the cloud, and unfortunately, he hit this spot here. You can see the crater around you. Uh, unfortunately, he was killed in this accident. Again, I'll put some pictures of the aircraft up. Um, very sad indeed, but you can see a few remains there of some of the burnt wreckage. The North American Harvard trainer was built in greater numbers than most combat aircraft during World War II, 17,096 being produced. By the end of the war, over 5,000 had been supplied to British and Commonwealth Air Forces. As conflict became inevitable, the Royal Air Force expansion programme demanded a massive increase in pilot training, and to meet this end, the Empire Air Training Scheme was established. The Royal Air Force soon turned to the United States to require the trainer aircraft needed to equip the scheme. 
The Harvard was one of the first American aircraft ordered by the RAF when a contract for 200 was placed in June 1938. British purchasing contracts reached 1100 before American lend-lease arrangements began. Some of the first aircraft were delivered to the United Kingdom, but soon after the outbreak of war the majority of flying training units were moved to Canada, southern Rhodesia and the United States. This made room for operational aircraft in Great Britain and provided safer conditions for training. Harvards were gradually withdrawn from Royal Air Force service in the 1950s. Czech pupil pilot Sergeant Julius Safranco was killed when his Harvard trainer crashed on Shining Tor in low cloud on the 30th of November 1944. Beginning at a descent to base at RAF Turn Hill in Shropshire based on his calculations, Sergeant Safranco nosed down for the zero visibility of the cloud. However, headwind had slowed him down and he was still over the last of the Pennine Hills and not just past Stoke as he might have thought. Anyway, that's the second one today. It's two more to go. It's actually four, not three. Which is even gooder. Gooder? What the hell was that language? Anyway, we're going to crack on now up to the top of Shining Tour. I'm just going to get a few pictures here, um, pay my respects, um, and then I'm going to uh, walk up to the top of Shining Tour, up the top of the hill there. Here we are, shining tall. Really stunning views there, look. Short in low, the road is in the distance, over towards Sutton Mast, all across the Cheshire Plain. You can see there the Jodwell Bank, Manchester. We're going to head down here along this ridge now to a couple more wrecks. You've got Kinder Scout, Bleak Glow and all that there. Fantastic, Coombs Moss, Corbar Hill. Across the moors over there towards Axe Edge. And uh, that's the Count Fiddle pub. Stunning. These are the rocks just on the edge. You can really fit the wind now. It's about 25, 30 miles an hour today. You let me around a little bit. We can see the Count Fiddle over here. There's the pub centre back to still. It's a bike along the way. That is a cracking road to ride. Got it to about an hour's peak. You see this road here by this bottom? That's the old road. And then there's a turnpike through here. So, you know, this, this route over the hill goes back hundreds, if not thousands of years. So, yeah, we can go up here now towards that spot. The more ends. On the horizon, there's still a poor cathedral. I took a picture, I'll put it up and show you. Look at the light there, you can see Chinley Churn where we were last week. South Head, Mount Famine, Kinder and the downfall behind it. Superb sunlight on that. Here we are, here's the airspeed Oxford wreck. This is the third one. Quite a bit left, a bit of a wheel hub there. Uh, a lovely wreath. Um, Stunning views over there as well. Uh, let me just find out about this for you. So, to look at what I find it, actually, the old reference I had was a six figure. If you look, it's a difference between a ten figure and a six figure grid reference. It's out by uh, quite a way. I think a six figure is like the size of a football field, a ten figure is the size of a parking lot. So, that's a difference. You can't always find. Um, 10 figure grid references for these on the internet, unfortunately. But we found it, you know, look around a bit, spend a bit of time doing it. So yes, I was gonna tell you about this crash, wasn't I? How rude of me. We'll get to get it behind us so you can see it while I'm talking. And um, I've got it open on the interweb because I was just looking at where it was. So, this was being used for a night time cross country exercise. Um, again, uh, 12th of March 1944, so I think all of these, that must have been a hell of a year for crashes. Um, there was three crew all killed, so they were going from RAF Culverley near Lampwich, Wrexham Litchfield at a height of 2,300 foot. They got it airborne at 22 minutes past 10, and sort of went on the initial short leg. But again, wind speed was increasing, and that seems to be a key thing in these crashes because obviously they haven't got the technology these days. They don't have time based on a certain wind speed, their route map maker, uh, their route sort of uh, planning, and this is what uh, does make a mess. Uh, they got a bearing 
uh, from Coverley War in the Wrexham area and they were heard by another aircraft at about quarter past 11 trying to contact Coverley to obtain a, another QDM which is a bearing from the airfield uh, but they were not received by the ground station and they went unanswered and nothing further was heard of the crew or aircraft after this point. Five days later, the badly broken up wreck was discovered here on Shining Tor, along with the bodies of the three crewmen who had been killed instantly. Now, I have read another story that states that actually they were found all sitting by the side of the aircraft and had died of hypothermia. So I don't know which one's true. I'll do a bit of digging on that either way. Um, it really is quite sad. It was travelling in a southerly direction and a, and a gentle turn to port when it struck the ground with a port wing before flying through the wall, which runs along here, I think, somewhere. Um, and then it began to disintegrate. Uh, the log was recovered from the wrecked aircraft and had noted making calls with no times, but estimated around half past 11. But it took them five days to find this wreck. Very sad indeed, that. I'll take some pictures and then what I'll do is show my respects as I always do, thank them for the service and whatever, it's very sad indeed. And then we're going to head on down here to where we're going to find another wreck site with two aircraft. Okay, uh, oh yeah this guy was RAF, not, uh, all the others were I think American Air Force, I think the next one is. Anyway, we're going to carry on down there now. Oxford. Mark 1 LX745 of a number 11 part advanced line unit in the RAF crashed on Shining Tor on the 12th of March 1944. The aircraft was being used for a night cross country exercise from RAF Calvary near Nantwich. The briefed route was to have been Calvary, Wrexham, Litchfield, Calvary at a height of 2,300 foot. They got airborne at 22.22 hours and headed on the initial short leg from just west of Nantwich to Wrexham. At this time the wind speed was increasing. The wireless operator obtained a QDR, a bearing from the Shet airfield, bearing from Calvary, while in the Wrexham area at 22.34, and was heard by another aircraft at 23.15, trying to contact Calvary from the Litchfield area to an, obtain a QDM. These calls, although heard by other aircraft, were not received by the ground station, and so went unanswered, and nothing was heard of the crew or aircraft after this point. It was five days later that the badly broken up wreck was discovered on the northern end of Shining Tor, along with the bodies of the three crewmen who had all been killed instantly. Cunningham cites a local shepherd, a Mr Albert Heathcote, who said the bodies of the men were found sitting beside their crashed aircraft. They had survived the impact but died of exposure waiting for help to arrive. This detail about the crew is not recorded elsewhere, but that's not to say the shepherd got it wrong. The aircraft had been flying in a southerly direction and in a gentle turn to port when it struck the ground with its port wing before flying through the wall which runs along the Cheshire-Derbyshire boundary. The aircraft then began to disintegrate and was scattered across the moor to around where the parts remain today. The wireless operator's log was recovered from the wrecked aircraft and he had noted making calls with no times but they were estimated to stop around 23.30 by using the log of other aircraft which had heard the calls as a guide. The court of inquiry in the accident held in the weeks after the crash concluded that the position of the aircraft had been miscalculated while flying in zero visibility with fluctuating wind speeds. With an hour before takeoff, the wind being about 35 miles an hour, decreasing to 15 miles an hour at takeoff and then to around 50 miles an hour at the time of the crash. It was thought that the drift caused by the weather was not compensated for as the gain in wind strength was unknown to the pilots. The crash occurred roughly at the time the aircraft would have been expected back at Calverley, and so it was thought that the pilots had descended through the clouds on ETA over base. The failure to hear or answer any radio calls was put down to the ground station working with another aircraft at the time when these calls were made. In addition to the findings of the court, it was noted that the darky radio navigation aid was not used and it was recommended that crews should maintain regular contact with base with bearings being requested at regular intervals. The three crew were all buried in Chester's Blackham Cemetery. This is the point at where Marla Valley might decided to do one and fly off into the distance, but this is the site of the P-47 Thunderbolt crash where two of them crashed. I'll give some more details after this short clip. But as you can see, this was on a very steep slope and uh, it's getting quite hairy trying to find the craters. There's not a huge amount of wreckage there either. Uh, so in the end, I decided it was better just to uh, go and retreat back up to the path at the top of the hill and get back on my way. But it's a lovely little valley there. P-47 
P47D Thunderbolts 427872 and 427898 of a 2906 Observation Group United States Air Force crashed on Cat's Tor on the 30th of September 1943. The two aircraft belonged to a unit which together with a six fighter wing were responsible for operational training at Atcham. They were combined and became the 495th Fighter Training Group during December 1943. Captain Stepp was leading the flight to check Staff Sergeant Morrison's formation flying ability. They took off from Atcham at 12.40. The weather at the time was fairly typical for the region, with cloud down to 1,500 feet, but with good visibility below the cloud. At around 14.30, the two aircraft were head to flying over the Bollington area, and shortly after a local farmer reported hearing an explosion. The two aircraft had flown directly into the side of the hill while in cloud. The investigation concluded that Captain Stepp had suffered possible radio failure as he was never heard requesting any guidance to safely return to Atcham. Captain Malta Stepp had been quite an experienced pilot and it just goes to show that even experienced pilots could fall prey to hills covered in clouds. Staff Sergeant Morrison was buried at Cambridge American Cemetery while Captain Stepp was later buried at Golden Gate National Cemetery near San Francisco. A bit of a phone call there. Fucking the Valiant model came off. Just said that. And they thought it was missing, so. Um, I thought I wanted to do the hike. It's going to be about a six mile instead of a nine mile there. I was going to go down to Jenkins Chapel, but I'm going to reach for some steps now and uh, see if I can find the damn place. I don't want to, but the edge. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, we're going to head back. I think it might have been this wafting around. Back to the wreck sites. I'll walk up to, but it was really windy. I think so that sounds like the most likely place it would have come off at. And just hope it's, uh, just hope it's there or someone's picked it up. Anyway, crack on down here for now. shit up send it home with you you brought it out here it's fucking lighter on the way back it starts to bore my piss now mate i might go vigilante soon anyway we're gonna head back to the car i'm gonna see if i can get to the cat and fiddle if it's still open might have cheeky hot chocolate rock and roll eh? rock and roll lifestyle <laughs> done all that don't you worry anyway we head up here now back along the ridge where we came no sign of this lavalier mike but uh, look, he came with two, I'll see how much a spare is and then weigh up whether it's worth buying one because I'm never really going to use two. I'm not doing any duets or anything, am I? So uh, anyway, I'll catch up with you when we get back to the car now. This is clearly where the ignorant dump their dog poo bags, there's at least three there. Anyway, no sign of mine there, which is where I put my uh, hard shell on. It's always interesting how different that hard shell makes, isn't it? I'm toasty warm, but it's just the fleece in the, in the base layer, it's quite a cold. So yeah, can't fed up there, car's just bad down here. I'm going to check what time they shot. If it's worth it, I'll nip and get a hot chocolate. If not, I'm calling for a Chinese on the way home. Boom, boom. So I'll catch up with you shortly. And that is the other side of that Macclesfield milestone saying to London. See what that says there. 161 miles. It sounds about right. I find out about that milestone because this is an old track, like I say, and I know that isn't that's the most recent road. What the old road did used to follow a different route, and the way they spell things on that is with the old um, double F for an S. So I reckon, uh, yeah, I reckon it's be pretty old though. This old milestone made from gritstone is near the Cat and Fiddle Inn and is by the side of the old 1759 turnpike which ran from Buxton to Macclesfield 
before it was replaced in 1823 by the current A537 road. The southeast face is particularly clean and is carved to Macclesfield, 6 miles. The northwest face, which has a bit of a coat and a lichen because it's on the shadier side, is carved with to London, 164 miles. The Cat and Fiddle was not built at the time of the 1759 turnpike, but it was a difficult route as the original turnpike descended 300 foot to the head of Goit's Clough and then climbed before a final descent into Buxton unsuitable for the increasing weight of horse-drawn wagons. In order to overcome this torturous route, power was sought in 1821 to construct a new turnpike. This was a mile longer, but maintained a steady gradient from the Cat and Fiddle to Buxton. In 1815, the turnpike trustees presented plans for an alternative route with less inclines. This was approved and subsequently completed in 1823. A traveller of a new turnpike in 1831 described the Cat and Fiddle as a newly erected and well accustomed inn or public house. It was built by John Ryle, a Macclesfield banker. The old and new roads joined near Burbage Church on the outskirts of Buxton, and the original turnpike from the fork near Burbage Road is still called Old Macclesfield Road. Well, uh, I was a bit shit. I uh, went to the Cat and Fiddle and they didn't do hot drinks anymore. You used to have a little bit where they used to do hot drinks. So it's just gin and whiskey now, which is all right, but uh, I'm not drinking at the minute. And uh, you have to put your number plate in the car park and all that, which is why no one on boat motorcycles comes here anymore, which is a shame. It used to be a real hot spot, but uh, there, there you go. That's what happens when you change hands and own the ship, isn't it? So, look there, put me uh, number plate in. So we're there, just to show you. And there's some lovely views behind us over across the Creek Peak District. But yeah, that was a nice walk that. Unfortunately, I had to cut it short. Originally, it was going to be nine miles and about 1,500 foot of ascent, but it turned out to be six miles and about 600 foot. So I saved myself a 1,000 foot of climbing, I suppose, but it was down to uh, my Lavalier, Lavalier mic came off. Um, I think it was just after shining tour, so the audio might have been a bit duff during this video, but so I apologise for that. So I had to backtrack and uh, look for it. But yeah, at the end of the day, I got to the four aircraft wreck sites. The last one um, is a bit dicey down there. There's not a lot to see, so I didn't go all the way to it, but either three I found them, which I was really happy with. So it's a nice little walk along shining tour from the Cow Fiddle. Not too much elevation if you're just going to walk along the top. You know? And then if you want to carry on, you can drop down to like Jenkins Chapel, which is where I was going to go, or down onto Irwood Reservoir and the Goit Valley and come back up via Derbyshire Bridge. I say, I used to live around here. There's loads of really good walks from here around Warbore Clough, Free Shards Head, Mac Forest, uh, Shuttling's Low. You know, there's a lot on this western side of the Peak District, and to be honest with you, it's not quite as busy. It does get busy, but not like Mam Tour was this morning. That looked horrendous when I drove past. Anyway, so that's the height. We did a, a few aircraft wrecks, stretched our legs a bit. I'm going to have my mint tiffin now, and uh, I'll catch you on the next walk. <laughs>